we have reached the fifth lesson that we're doing on finding yourself in transition. And since everyone here um, has heard me talk about it before, I will forego any further introductions. But what we've gotten to now is the third stage of the transition process. And, you know, of course, those three stages are an ending, the void, and new beginnings. And the, uh, the title today, New Beginnings, The Promised Land, reflects the fact that, that uh, Bob was using the Israelites' journey from Egypt through the desert into the promised land of Israel as um, a metaphor and as an illustration of what this process is for us as human beings. And so what Bob says is a new beginning starts as an internal experience, often a very subtle one. We may detect the inner cues or we may not be aware of the new beginning until there is an external change in our life. And, you know, it's funny, I've, um, I think this especially shows up in relationships and careers. I mean, you know, I know in my own life, <laughs> a lot of the new beginnings have been the result of something fairly dramatic. Um, and, and maybe that's, that's just me. Um, but I've seen a lot of people who over time suddenly realize that this relationship, this marriage that they're in just is, it, it's, it, it, it's not working anymore. Or, you know, they've grown apart from this person or that this job is just, you know, they used to be excited about it and it just leaves ash in their mouth when they, you know, get in the car to go to work. And it's not necessarily because their partner changed or because their place of employment changed. Maybe nothing has changed. And that's the problem because they've been growing in ways that they may not be completely aware of internally. You know, maybe you've been reading some of those spiritual books somebody gave you or something that you heard in church has been kind of working at you in your subconscious. Or, you know, maybe you've started... Um, listening to Brene Brown's podcasts or, you know, whatever. But in some way, you have been outgrowing the old you. And it's slow, but one day you look around and it's like, something's not right here. It's just not, it's, it's not, it's not the same. And what's happened is, you know, your mindset's changed. And as, you know, Brad says in the little, um, meme I have on there to change your life, you must change your mindset. And, and kind of it works in the in the reverse as well. If you've changed your mindset, it will change your life in one way or another. So in the Bible, we talk about as above and, and so below. And, you know, kind of the old school version of that um, is echoed in the wording of the Lord's Prayer, you know, on earth as it is in heaven. But metaphysically, what that actually means is, you know, as Bob explains here, when a new beginning takes place, the external circumstances of our life begin to reflect the internal transformation that has already taken place. So metaphysically, heaven is our, our higher consciousness. And the idea is that on, you know, on earth here in the, in the manifest realm here where I can touch it and feel it and, you know, reach out and grab my desk or whatever is in front of me, that if I've made changes in heaven, in consciousness, you know, if I've begun following the I am that I am, the, the Christ that I am, that at some point that will manifest itself. That's going to change things. It's, it's going to do something in the, in the real world. And it will be because I have changed internally. So when we look at this, there are at times some haphazard elements to it. Um, if we are not specific and focused, we can change in ways that we may not want to. 
um, Laura and I sometimes have talked about, you know, we don't want our life to become, you know, we, we go to work and we come home and we binge Netflix and we go to bed because from what I am able to gather from um, commercial television, it's all, it, it almost lulls us into this sense of that artificial construct of life as simply a means of acquiring and consuming. That that's really what life's all about. That, oh, you need this new thing. And we're going to show you some funny stories about people who need things and when they get the things, you know, they're, they're better. Or when they get the, you know, the girl or the guy, um, they're better. Uh, that, that happiness is outside of us. That's what most of commercial media is designed to train us to believe because that keeps the carrot out in front of us and keeps us striving in the wrong direction, right? So if we are going to say, you know what? Popular culture is not teaching me what I need to learn in order to progress as a real human being, then where am I going to find that guidance? And one of those places is within. In fact, the most important place that we find guidance is within. And one of the you know, couple of the ways that we do that is through prayer and meditation, right? And Bob says, as we pray for guidance and trust in God, we will experience the new beginning at the right time and in a way that is right for us. A lot of people have problems with prayer. And, you know, as I've said more than once, you know, trying to pray is praying. It's not like you can do it wrong. I know that, um, and I may have shared this with you, when I first started to go into ministry, the one thing that scared me the most was having to pray with people out loud. You know, that was the one thing I thought, I'm probably going to do this wrong. Um, and, you know, I just had to get over it. You know, we, we, we even had exercises in our prayer and meditation class where um, Bob, actually, I took prayer and meditation from Bob Brummett, the guy that wrote this book. Um, and he would put little slips of paper with prayer subjects in them in, you know, like just in a little basket or something and pass around. And we would all pull the slips of paper out. And then each of us would have to lead a prayer based on, you know, whatever it was. But, you know, for most folks that aren't required to do that, you know, the, the real thing is, are you praying? And the thing is, is it's, it's one thing to just, you know, like in, in quick moments, say, when you hear somebody, you hear somebody, you know, got uh, diagnosed with COVID, you say, oh, please, God, you know, take good care of them. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I think we need to do is develop some kind of a prayer life where we discipline ourselves to saying, okay, every day when I get up or every night before I go to bed or, you know, like our Muslim friends, you know, five times a day. And if you think about it, before you get out of bed, before you go to sleep and saying grace at all three meals is five times, um, even if it's just those things. You know, we, we stop and we drop into prayer and we get connected. If we make some kind of habit, some kind of, of, of regular connection with God, it's going to change us. Um, I can say that, you know, personally from my own experience uh, through the process of recovery, that uh, when I was, you know, first began praying on a regular basis, simply to, 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 to be and stay sober, uh, it changed me and it changed me at depth. And I, I could not have predicted the way that it was going to work out. But, you know, like Bob says here, the right time and in a way that's right for us. It was, it was certainly the right time in a way that was right for me. So what he talks about is the idea that 
sometimes we may we may not be honest with ourselves about what it is we really want and that if we want to really have a new beginning you know if we really want to break with the past that we have got to get honest with ourselves about what it is we want i i, I titled the slide tell me what you want what you really really want um every time i hear that spice girls thing i think about a uh, one day in my um I think it was my tactical electronic warfare class that i took out at uh, fort Huachuca. and this, i can't talk a whole lot about the specifics because it was all done in a top secret environment but the day that they had the guy come in to teach us about space operations he kept saying tell me what you want what you really really want and his, his point was, when your space guy comes in, he knows about things that he's not allowed to tell you about. So what you have to do is not try to guess what his tools are, not try to you know guess what it is that's possible, but simply say what it is you really want to have happen in that area and he may be able to bring something to bear that you don't even know is in the inventory right now. And the universe is a lot like that. There, there are things out there that are available for us that we have no idea of. I had a friend in ministry who just, when she found out that I was coming to Baton Rouge, and, you know, I, I didn't come here for a church. I came because uh, I came with Laura. And she said, just stay open. You know, and so what that means is, is I need to decide what it is I really want in my experience here and be completely open to whatever it is that shows up. Bob says one way to prepare for a new beginning is to discover your soul's deepest desire. And then he says there are some specific questions you may ask in order to facilitate the discovery process. What's funny is that, you know, <laughs> I think without having read this chapter beforehand, when we were talking about coming to Baton Rouge and what I would do here, Laura actually asked me to consider some of these questions. And, you know, they're really basic, but a lot of us probably gave up asking ourselves these questions after we left high school. What is it that I've always enjoyed doing? What has always come naturally for me? What have I felt naturally drawn or attracted to? Laura actually asked me this next question. What would I do with my life if I were not concerned with money? What would I do if I knew I could not fail? I think she asked me that one too. If I were to die today, what would feel unfinished in my life? And what is so important to me that I would risk everything in order to achieve or experience it. You know, if, if you've been looking for a new beginning, a good place to begin would be to journal on some of these questions. You know, just pull out the journal and say, what is it I really like to do? You know, what am I good at just without even trying? What, what am I, where are my talents, you know? What would I do with my life if I weren't concerned with money or if I weren't afraid of failing? These are really important questions. But if we can answer those and then begin to, you know, focus our prayer and meditation life in that direction, simply allowing ourselves to put out the idea of the experience and not necessarily how it shows up. In other words, you know, what I want, what I really, really want, but not necessarily how it's going to get there, right? And that's that's how we target our specificity. Um, you know, in the in the all of the visioning board classes that you can take, and all the things that you can learn about visioning, people tell you to be very specific. But what is not helpful is being very specific about exactly what's going to show up in your life it's the experience you know how that's going to show up 
may end up surprising you. Bob says, how specific should we be in, in, in I can say this, in envisioning desired results? Perhaps it is best to specifically imagine the quality of the desired result without being too specific on the form that it should take. And, and I, I love this, uh, you know, the simple little meme, ask what, not how. And put out there in prayer, what, what sort of experience, what, how you want your heart to feel, but, you know, not what you want your heart to feel, but not how. Bob says, it seems that we are in a partnership with God. At times we need to act and at other times just be still and listen. And, you know, my commentary on that was it's kind of like marriage. You know, sometimes I got to get off my butt and sometimes I just need to sit still and listen. You know, that's, that's fair. I love this, uh, this quote. Enlightenment is constant awareness of this world as, an in, as inherently divine of life as a loving partnership with God and every moment as an offer, opportunity to offer and receive, to give and receive love. So it's, it's a constant two-way connection. Um, we, we give and receive, we listen, we act. That being still and listening is extremely important. And the way that I do that is through meditation. Um, some people find it in their dream lives. Some people find it through journaling. But there, there are times when, you know, it's our culture is so wrapped up in people doing, doing, doing all the time. And there's very little time left for us to simply be but it's often in those in between times which is what the void is all about that we really hone in on what it is that is really ours to do now when when we take off in, a, in what we think is a new direction but we're really not ready that creates what Bob calls a pseudo beginning. And we talked about false starts from back in the void. Um, you, you know, the idea that, you know, you may leave the void too soon. You, you, you're not really, you don't haven't really worked out your stuff and, you know, you take off and, and it usually ends in disaster as it did for uh, some of the Israelites who tried to rush into the promised land uh, you know, before they were supposed to, and they got, they got crushed. Bob says, sometimes we may create an external beginning before we are internally ready. What we've then created is only a pseudo beginning, not the real thing. And, you know, great examples of that are you know, something that in recovery we refer to as a, a geographic fix. You know, it's like when I think, okay, Things haven't worked out well for me here, but I'm going to I'm going to move someplace else and start all over again, and it'll be better. Except I'm taking me with me. It's, it's and you know there's the old story about the the guy that um, arrives at the gates of a city, and the gatekeeper, uh, you know, kind of stops him and, and asks him what he's doing. The guy says, "Well, I'm looking for a new place to live." Can you tell me what the people who live here are like? And the gatekeeper says, well, what, what were the people like where you were before? And the guy talks about how horrible they were. And the gatekeeper says, well, you know, people here are a lot like that. And the guy moves along. And then the next person shows up and, and it, it, it's a woman. And she asks the same question. And the gatekeeper asks her, well, what were the people like before we lived? So people were great, loved them. You know, I almost hated to leave, but it was time to move on. And he says, well, people are like that here. Because it's, it's, you know, it's who we're bringing with us. So then, of course, we asked ourselves, well, how do I know, right? How do I know uh, a new beginning from a pseudo beginning? How, how do I, how do I, why do I get the idea? So what, what Bob does is he says that, you know, we can kind of tell if it is an addiction or a preference. And I, I love the, the, the 
kind of the way he, he worded that. Basically, if something is an addiction, that means we've put the locus of happiness outside of ourselves. If it's preference, then we're we're not addicted. We're not we're not attached. Um, our, our Buddhist friends would say to one way or another. You know, either would be okay. And um, <laughs> you may not be able to see this graphic really well, but I just cracked up when I found this study online. So this somebody actually did a research um, study and like a peer reviewed paper on the preference map of consumers with addictions to alcohol. And they were, they were doing a comparison of people who like alcohol and people who like potato chips, which it was British. So they call them crisps. And on their little chart here, you can see that the more uh, preference you have for alcohol, the least you like chips or the least you want to have chips. It's like, give me the booze. I need the booze. Um, and you know, in another, uh, version of this, like smack in the middle of that red line, they had a dot. And that was basically kind of the sweet spot. And it was like where somebody's like, yeah, you know, I, I, I can have a beer or I can have chips or I can have both. It's all good. If you are attached to having things a certain way, when you go to begin something, it's an attachment that you've carried with you from the past. And it's unlikely that you're, what you have there is a genuine new beginning. And when we were talking earlier about families and Christmas, boy, you want to talk about attachments from the past? You know, we carry those into the holidays like a battle flag. And it's interesting to say, okay, well, if I wasn't addicted to everything being a certain way, but simply to experiencing the holidays as, you know, what we're going to be praying for, which is peaceful and, and, uh, and loving and joyous, you know, what, what if that looks very differently than all of the, you know, the days of yore, right? Is it an addiction or is it a preference? And, and that's, that is a great thing to look at when we're being honest with ourselves. And I, <laughs> I'm certainly someone who's had to face that my own self. So this is, you know, like a, a real key in this. If you are addicted to a new beginning or, you know, kind of what you think the quality of the new beginning is, then deal with the addiction itself before attempting the new beginning. Unhook your happiness from that thing, whatever that thing is, you know, that outcome or that very specific, you know, piece of somebody else's behavior or whatever it might be. And then try to begin. Because until you do, it's it's going to end up the, the way that it always has in the past. It'll be a pseudo beginning and not a new beginning. So essentially, you know, that what it, it, it's time when it's time. You know, Bob says a true new beginning will occur only after we've completed the work from previous stages. And when we are internally ready, we will somehow find a way to create a new beginning. We may not know how to do it, and that's okay. But when we're ready, we're ready. Um, Laura and I were watching... Uh, the second Narnia movie last night, Prince Caspian. And one of the things that I liked about him was when, you know, when it's finally time for him to be handed the kingship, he says, you know, I'm not ready for this. And, you know, of course, Jesus lion tells him, well, then, you know, that's, that's the proof that you are ready, basically, is, you know, that's, that's how I know you are ready, is because you think you're not. Right? A new beginning brings its own set of challenges. We're often in unfamiliar territory. And we may have a fear of being unprepared for our new task. You know, I, it's funny, Laura and I talk about this a lot. You know, a lot of adulting is just kind of pretending to be a grown up. Um, it's like, I don't know if I'm ready for this, but, you know, 
I got to do it. And when they hand you that baby and you got to go home with it, well, you're a parent, you know, and, and at, at some level you're ready because th that's what you're doing. It's the same thing with getting ordained and taking over a church. It, it, there's no, there's no way to be a hundred percent prepared for it except to dive in and do it. And you know we may be scared, but we we just have to have a little faith and and get past it and do it. And a lot of that faith comes from being willing to make a commitment. And in, uh, in Bob's notes at the end of the chapter, there are several different bullet points that I combined here because they all deal with commitment. You know, say, there's a reason that Yoda says a Jedi must have the deepest commitment. Bob says a new beginning calls forth the need for new commitments. A commitment challenges us to concrete action and often to sacrifice. And I love the way that he describes that, that that sacrifice is being willing to give up a certain amount of freedom in one area to grow or to become, and maybe, you know, eventually to being more free. You know, I think about the time I spent in the military and God knows, you know, I, I, I had to make a serious commitment and I had to sacrifice a lot of freedom a lot of times uh, to do that. But now that I'm retired, um, you know, and, and, I, and I get a retirement check every month, that's a certain amount of freedom that I have that I don't ever have to worry about. You know, Laura and I have made a commitment to each other. We've made a lot of commitments to each other. And there's some sacrifice or, you know, a willingness to sacrifice in, uh, in a lot of the things we do, you know, when, when Laura was looking at jobs that, um, you know, she might take uh, before we chose to come here from Birmingham, um, one of the things that happened was my old ch home church in Florida came open. And I'd made a commitment to her a long time ago that I wouldn't ask her to move to Florida, which she hates, unless that church came open. And so when it came open, she said, Charles, you, you should apply for that. And I did. And I actually interviewed with the search committee. Laura would have been willing to give up, you know, not only her, her job in Birmingham, but this new job that she has in Baton Rouge because she made a commitment to me. Now, as it turned out, I didn't get that job. So what do we do? You know, I go where, you know, where her career takes us because I made the commitment to her that, you know, we're, we're going to follow your career first. You know, and sometimes there's, there's give and take there. Like, you know, when, you know, the one church that I, you know, I kind of um, always wanted to take came open. You know, now I know, I know deep in my heart of hearts that I did not get that job for a very good reason. And I am totally at peace with that. Um, I, I appreciate very much that she kept her commitment to me. And incur not, not just let me apply for it, but encouraged me to do that, you know? So as he says, a commitment challenge us to concrete action and often to sacrifice. A true commitment is not to anything outside of yourself, but is actually a commitment to yourself. And that almost bears saying twice. A true commitment is something that is actually to yourself. It's an agreement to sacrifice in some area of your life in order to enrich other areas of your life. Now, this is a big one. Making a commitment means risking failure or rejection. So unless we're willing to face our fear, we will never make a real commitment. When, you, when I have committed to doing things, right, I have risked failing. And boy, have I ever failed a lot, you know? I mean, I went to California and got a master's degree in directing for theater and film because I was committed to trying to get into the Directors Guild training program. I inter I actually, you know, out of however, you know, like a thousand people that they test for it, I was one of the hundred people they interviewed. I didn't get into one of the 10 slots, you know, but I committed to giving it a shot. And I've made a lot of other commitments along the way. Some of them have not worked out at all. Boy, oh boy, have I ever, you know, like Will Smith says, you know, fail fast, fail often, but fail forward. 
And if you don't commit, you, you, you can't get into that possibility, right? We have to get past our fear of failure. Everybody who has ever achieved anything important has failed somewhere along the way, right? A true commitment puts very powerful forces in motion. To be committed is to accept responsibility for being a creator in one's life. No great thing has ever been accomplished without commitment. Now, one thing that's interesting is that there are times when a new beginning is not really visible from the outside. Bob says it as not all new beginnings involve dramatic external changes in our life. Perhaps very little has changed externally, but internally we're no longer living in the same world. And that goes back to the old Zen saying, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. You know, the, the, the difference is in the consciousness we do it from. Um, you know, many of us may become very different people on the inside, but, you know, maybe we have the same job. Um, maybe we have the same partners. Maybe, we, you know, our, our clothes may be the same. We may, we may look the same. But internally, we're very different, you know, and, and I know from um, my time in recovery, you know, there's some people, um, especially the more quote unquote functional drunks, um, you know, people that did not lose their job, you know, didn't have a slew of um, lawsuits pending against them, you know, they had just reached their own personal bottom, right? So, as they go through the process of recovery, their external life may look to a lot of people pretty much the same. They have the same job, live in the same house. You know, they drive the same car, they wear the same clothes. But I can tell you, on the inside there, it's a whole different human being. So returning to the Bible story, the children of Israel under the leadership of Joshua finally conquer the promised land. Now, you know, and of course we know Moses gets them there. And Moses metaphysically is, you know, the drawing out. And Moses did in fact draw them out of Egypt, out of slavery, out of the sense consciousness. So what is it that takes them into the promised land, into the new beginning, into the, the land of the I am? Well, it's the embodiment of, you know, the warrior, the, those qualities of strength and discipline and courage. It takes strength and discipline and courage, you know, to, to get us, like, to, to make that commitment, to be brave enough to let go of our addictions and say, okay, universe, I'm open to what you show up with and move us into the promised land. So as he says, you know, Joshua is the symbol of a warrior an embodiment of the qualities of strength, discipline, and courage, and these are all needed for a new beginning. And this is, I think I mentioned this last week, that the names Joshua and Jesus both represent expressions of the I am, the Spirit of God individualized in and as each and every one of us. So it is. <clears throat> 